Welcome to the Real Church Podcast. You can learn more about Real Church online at realchurch.today. Now here's today's message. Uh, you know, I'm going to preach from my spirit. Amen. Not out of my heart, but from my spirit. It's going to pass through my heart. So out of my spirit, the Bible says, out of your belly shall flow a river of living water. That belly is your spirit. It's not the belly you fill up with food, but uh, it's somewhere in that locality apparently. But out of your spirit, the Holy Ghost River flows. Flows up through your soul, through your will, through your mind, through your emotions. And then it flows out through my mouth. Now then, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take what I say today, don't let it stop with your mind. That's where it's gonna come first. But open up your heart and let it go down into your spirit. It's coming out of my spirit and I want it to get down in your spirit as pastor said a while ago. Don't let it stop with your head. That's the surface of your heart. And Jesus gave a parable of the sower And he said that some of the seed fell on hard surface and it didn't take root and the birds and the devil came and got it. But whenever your mind is the surface of your heart and you've got to let it get deep into your heart, it can't just lay in the surface of your mind or the devil will steal it before you get home. But if you, through the Holy Spirit that guides you into truth, will let what I say today get deep down into your spirit, then out of your spirit will flow a mighty power that will enable you to speak the word and live the word and do the word and command the devil and he will have to obey you. Hallelujah. Woo, hallelujah. I'm gonna dump the whole load on you. I didn't come to preach to those who were not here. Amen. Now, I, I, I preached as interim pastor for about three and a half months of the church that I founded in Texarkana during this COVID thing, and nobody was there. But you know, I have, <laughs> I have preached to a house full of people that was deader than those empty chairs were. Those chairs were even shouting. The rocks cried out. Hallelujah. (laughs) I'm feeling better all the time. (laughs) Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I want to talk to you today about the fellowship we have with Jesus. That's going to be maybe different than what you've heard or what you think maybe. The fellowship we have with the Son of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9, it says God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, I'm gonna stay in that one verse. Start out with the one who calls you into the fellowship of his son, God. And God is faithful. If anybody's gonna call me, I wanna know if they're faithful. If I'm gonna enter into a fellowship with somebody, I wanna know if they're faithful. Well, God is faithful. And he's faithful to keep his promises. Second Corinthians 1 and 20 said, all the promises of God are in him, yes, and in him, amen to the glory of God by us. He's faithful to keep his promises, but he's faithful to heal our sick bodies. 
And Matthew 8 and verse 17 says that Jesus took our infirmities, our pains, and he bare our sicknesses. He's faithful to heal our sick bodies. And he's faithful to help us in our time of need. And Hebrews 13 and 5 and 6 says, Jesus will never leave us, nor will he forsake us, so that we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man can do unto me. God is faithful. But God calls us. And the scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 24, faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. Now when God calls us, every believer has a call. You may not be called to be a pastor, an evangelist, or an apostle, or a prophet, but you are called to be a witness And that witness means that you have a ministry and you have a call to edify your brothers and sisters in Christ. So there's a call. If you're on the job, God has a call. He has a service for you to render in his name on your job. So God calls you to a ministry and you need to understand what that call is so that you can honor God and be that witness wherever you are. But when God calls us, whatever he calls us to, he always calls us in two areas. Number one, he calls us to be something. Number two, he calls us to do something. So no matter what your call is, it has to do with being and doing. Now then, when God calls you to be something and to do something, he's not just gonna leave you out there on your own. But go back to 1 Thessalonians 5 and 24. Faithful is he who calls you who will also do it. That simply means if he calls you to do something, he will give you the power to do it. Look at the call to be something. In John 1 and verse 12, the Bible says, to as many as received Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You mean when I get saved, I'm not a son of God? Well, you're not a full grown son. When when somebody gets born, they're a baby. And, and you're a spiritual baby. And, and, and the Bible says that as a newborn babe in Christ, you're to desire the sincere milk of the word. But you see, God did not call you to be a baby. And then you go from babyhood, just drinking milk, you go to a child. And the apostle Paul said, when I was a spiritual child, I spoke as a child, I acted as a child, but when I became a full grown man, I put away childish things. So there's a point, he didn't call you to be a child. He called you to be a full grown, mature son of God. And there's a process of becoming what he has called you to be. Are you with me? You just don't get there overnight then the same is true with doing. He has called us to do. Now understand fellowship as we go along here, that fellowship is equal sharing. So when Jesus calls us into salvation, when he calls us into whatever he calls us into, he is calling us into what he was called to do. And in John chapter 14 and verse 12, Jesus said to them that believe on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. (laughs) Hallelujah. You see, we're called not just to be, we're called to do. And Jesus said, whenever you believe on me, I call you into what I am doing and the works that I have been doing. In fact, the book of Acts starts out 
uh, with these words, all that Jesus began to teach and do. That refers back to what Jesus did on earth. And what he's about to do, he's about to say that the book of Acts is a continuation of everything Jesus taught and everything Jesus did. I heard a preacher, well known to, to radio listeners, that made a statement, and, and I know him, I've met him, uh, he passes not too far from me. But I was listening one day when I was driving home and, uh, and I heard him say, and I listened carefully to make sure that's what he said, but he said the book of Acts is just a history book. Now you come back tonight and we're gonna find out that there's nothing in the word of God that's dead. History is dead. My history is dead. Thank God some of it is dead. History is dead. The book of Acts is the model church for today. And rather than model our church after some church on earth, we need to model it after the book of Acts because the book of Acts is a continuation of everything that Jesus began to teach and to do and he commanded us to go and teach all things that he commanded and, and make disciples by doing that. Now, I'm, I'm getting wild here, so I won't, I won't, I may, let me come back. But now, here's what I want to say before I get on down further. We're, we're called into the fellowship of his anointing, his power. And, and he gives us the power to do what he did. And he did supernatural things. And you know, if the Holy Ghost were taken out of the midst of so many churches today, they could continue to do everything they're doing and never miss him. What does that mean? That means we're operating in the flesh, in the natural, that which our natural talents can do, that which our natural abilities can do, that which our natural gifts can do. But I want to tell you, when Jesus said the works that I do, he wasn't talking about doing what you can naturally do. He said, I'm going to bring you into doing what I supernaturally do, and there is anointing of the Holy Ghost that takes us into doing the supernatural, and we need to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. We need to cast out devils by the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Somehow I managed to shout by myself, but you're welcome to join me. Woo. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Now then, let me get a little ugly here. When God calls us to whatever he calls us to do, he calls us out of the world. Jesus said you're in the world, but you're not of the world. Let me say it again. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. The Bible says we're in the flesh, but we don't walk after the flesh. We're separate. Second Corinthians 6 and verse 17 and 18. God said, come out, come out, come out from among them, the world, and be separate, and I will receive you. He said, touch not the unclean thing, Come out, and I will receive you. Now listen to the verse 18. He said, I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. Now then, backing up about three verses to verse 14. He said, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, I could preach a lot there. And then he said the reason for that, what, and he asked the question, what fellowship, we're talking about fellowship with the Son of God, what fellowship does righteousness have with unrighteousness? 
And then Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11 says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. That does away with compromise, does it? Ooh. About every verse I give has got an hour's worth of preaching in it. Hallelujah. But what we're talking about is being called into the fellowship of God's Son. And in order to have the fellowship of God's Son, we have to come out from among the fellowship of unbelievers and the fellowship of unrighteousness because there is no fellowship that righteousness has with unrighteousness and Jesus does not have fellowship with unrighteousness. There is no unrighteousness in him and whenever we're called into his fellowship, we're called into the fellowship of righteousness. Woo! Come out! Come out. Hallelujah. <laughs> now then, we're called into the highest level of fellowship. The highest level of fellowship is equal sharing. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 17, says that if we're the children of God, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Mm. Joint heirs, equal heirs. But Jesus gives to us an equal share of everything he is, we're called to be what he is, and we have an equal share of everything that he does, the supernatural, he shares that with us. We're called into his fellowship. Hallelujah. And it's an equal share. Now then, I, I, let me blow your mind. You like to be have your mind blown with, with, uh, with unusual statements? Well, here it is. Fellowship does not mean two fellows in a ship. <laughs> Boy, some of you are having to change your theology right now. <laughs> fellowship, <clears throat> fellowship is not just hanging out with Jesus. Amen? Amen? Jesus is our friend. But it's more than just a friendship with Jesus. Friendship is kind of a casual thing. Fellowship is permanent every minute of every day. Fellowship is a divine connection with the person of the Son of God. <laughs> Let me say it again. Fellowship is a divine connection with the person of the Son of God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Amen and amen. You see, we're in him and he is in us. We're involved with what he is doing and he is involved with what we are doing. We know him. We experience him. And Acts 17 and 28 says, in him we live, we move, we have our being. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Woo. Hallelujah. And Ephesians 2 and verses, uh, Ephesians 1 and verse 22 and 23. I get in a hurry. And I either start stuttering or speaking in tongues. I don't know which. <laughs> Ephesians 1 verse 22 and 23 says that God has made Jesus the head over all things. 
Now, when I read this, I had a thought I never had before. And I'm, 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 I don't really want to pursue it, but I might. That God has made Jesus head over all things to the church. Now, I've always emphasized that Jesus is the head of the church. But listen to what it said. God has made Jesus head over all things to the church. <laughs> I'd like to preach on that, I, I think. I, I hadn't thought about it much, but I'd like to. Sounds good. But the church, then it says, which is his body. The church is the body of the Lord. Now then it says that Jesus fills his body with all in all. He feels all in all. In other words, he is saying not just to the church, that the church is in this fellowship, but he's saying to every Christian that he fills you with himself. That's the fellowship. He fills you with himself. He fills the church with himself. Yes. Hallelujah. He wants us to humble ourselves. And if you don't humble yourself, I had a thought the other day and I hadn't thought of this in a long time, <laughs> but it must fit right here because I'm anointed. <laughs> and I wrote it down and it says the person that is full of themselves is very empty. I think you're the first church I've ever said that publicly to. Aren't you blessed to know that? When you're proud, you're full of yourself. But when you're humble, you empty self out. Woo! <laughs> And when you get empty of self, then God will pour himself into you and you become one with him. Fellowship with the Son of God. Matthew 6 and 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these other things that you need, God will add them. Now then, what's that saying? That is saying that in this fellowship we have with him, that all my resources are made available to him. When you get saved, when you get saved, then all of your resources are available to him. The car that you have is really available to him to do what he wants to with it. Whatever you have is your resource, you make that available to him. Whatever you need, Lord, I just call on me. It's available. But in turn, the fellowship, which is equal, Jesus comes back and says, all my resources whew, are at your, <laughs> at your disposal. Now that's a deal. That is a deal. You need to hit the bell and say, it's a deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Woo. His resources in exchange for my resources. Whew. Hallelujah. But it means his responsibilities are my responsibilities. And then my responsibilities are his responsibilities because we're in him and he is in us. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Now then, what are we talking about when we talk about this fellowship with the Son of God? Let me go through the verse again. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. In that name and titles tells us the kind of fellowship that he has called us into. Now he has called us into the fellowship of the name Jesus. Matthew 1.21 tells us 
that his name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Isn't that wonderful? Hallelujah. You, you know, there's a bumper sticker that I like, but I don't like. And it says, I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven. Now, it's a half truth. Well, it's a whole truth, because we're not perfect. And we are forgiven, but we're not just forgiven. Because salvation has a twofold meaning. Salvation means deliverance from the penalty of sin, and that's done by receiving forgiveness. But it also means deliverance from the power of sin. Are you with me? And Romans chapter six and verse 12, 10, 12, I believe it is, 12, 13, and 14. Now listen carefully, and I'm not gonna stay here a long time, but this is the fellowship of the saving name of Jesus. Let not sin reign or rule in your mortal body. Now that clear enough. Don't sin. Don't go around and say, well, my body's sinning, but my spirit is not. <laughs> oh, I, you've not heard that? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah that's, that's common. Yeah. But I've got news for you. <laughs> Let not sin reign in your mortal body. And then it clarifies it a little more in verse 13. It says, neither yield the members, now body is kind of general, isn't it? But when it says, don't yield the members, don't yield your tongue, don't use your ears, don't use your eyes, and don't use your nosy nose, don't use your hands, don't yield the members of your body as an instrument of unrighteousness unto sin. But then yield, first yield yourselves to God. Now it's not talking about the body here. It's talking about self. Self is the soul. And you are to yield self. You're to yield your will. You're to yield your natural mind. You're to yield your emotions, your soul. Yield yourself to God. In other words, yield your will to his will. And when you yield or surrender your will to his will, then you no longer live by your willpower, you live by his willpower. As long as you're living by your willpower, you'll keep on yielding the members of your body as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But once you yield yourself, once you surrender your will to the will of God and you allow his will to live through you and you start living by his will, then you'll be able to yield the members of your body as instruments of righteousness unto God. Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Well, why hadn't you been saying that all along? <laughs> yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Mm. Now, verse 14 tells us why you can do that. Sin, he says, shall not have dominion over you. Sin shall not have dominion over your body, your soul, or your spirit. Sin shall not have dominion over your body. Sin shall not have dominion over the members of your body because we're not under law or the law of Moses, but we are under grace. Grace gives us the power to reject the rule and reign of sin in our body. Now then, I'm trying to get to the end before I get through with my introduction here. (laughs) 
But, but here, let me go ahead and say this, and I may say it a dozen more times. They, they tell us that we are forgiven because of God's grace. But when it comes to sinning, they say, well, I'm not perfect. I have to sin. I have to sin. Well, if the grace of God is powerful enough to blot out my past and remove my, uh, the, the, the penalty of all my sins, and I am forgiven, and, and it is though I have never sinned because God's grace is so powerful, it can wipe out my past sinful life. And I owe nothing. I owe nothing. I do not owe a debt. My penalty and debt has been paid. But when it comes to sinning, God's grace is just so weak that it's just like I'm still living under the law. I can't help sinning. Hmm? Am I meddling? I know, I know you wish a lot of those that are not here were here. You're saying, boy, I, I know oh, so-and-so really would need this. But get in in your spirit and you can go tell them, okay? Hallelujah. I don't know where I'm at at this point. But we're delivered from the power of sin as well as we're forgiven for the penalty of sin. The Bible tells us concerning the body and the members of the body not being yielded as instruments of unrighteousness. Romans chapter eight and uh, somewhere. I think it may be about verse 13. It says, if you live after the flesh, you're gonna die. Now he's talking to Christians. But if you through the spirit mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Doesn't that make it clear? And then I think it's the next verse that says, we are not debtors to live after the flesh. We're not in debt to sin. We're not in debt to the penalty of sin because Jesus by his grace and blood has blotted out our debt for sin. So he has delivered us from our debt for sin. But he has delivered us from our debt to sin. Are you listening carefully? I need to say that again, I think. You see, we have a debt we could not pay, but Jesus paid the debt for our sins. So he paid the debt for the penalty of our sins. But his grace also paid our debt to sin. We go around saying, well, I'm forgiven. He's paid my debt for all of my penalties and all of my sinning. But he, we forget to understand that we not only have a debt known as the penalty of our sin, we have a debt to sin until Jesus saves us, until we know the power of his saving name, he delivers us from the power of sin and we no longer are in debt to the flesh. We don't owe the flesh anything. We don't owe the dictates of sin anything. We have the power to resist. We, we have the power to refuse to let sin rule and reign in our bodies. Well, I, yeah, go ahead. And just go ahead and clap your hands, okay? That'll get the blood circulating again. Some of you are wondering, am I dead or alive? Well, if you clap your hands a little bit, then the life will start circulating. Whew. I'm afraid to look. Well, I gotta go home, rest for it, come back. No. 
worried about y'all. <laughs> let, me, let me stay on this name just a little further. In th this is a better side, okay? This is a reason for all of that. In Psalm 91 and verse 14, the Lord said, I will set him on high because he has known my name and to know Jesus in its saving power, saving us from the penalty of sin, saving us from the power of sin, that's the highest level of knowing his name. And when you know his name in that degree, he said, I'm gonna set you on high. Oh, there's gonna be high living for you. Gonna be high living for you. But if you don't know his name, you see, when you get saved and experience the saving name of Jesus from the penalty of sin and the power of sin, every demon is informed. The Holy Spirit sends a letter to every demon and the devil that now these people know my name and these people can use my name and when they speak my name, it will be authority. Are you listening to me? It will be authority. Remember the seven sons of Schema? The, 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 schema, Schema, I'm in a hurry. Whenever they saw Paul casting out devils, they decided they could do that too and they come up on this demon possessed guy and they say in the name that, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, Come out! And the demon <laughs> laughed and said, we don't have any memo here that you know the name of Jesus. And if you don't know the saving name of Jesus, then too bad. And they jumped on him, stripped him naked, and, he, and Joyce says he was the first stripper that ran across public. <laughs> Streaker, not stripper. Well, he was stripped. <laughs> He was stripped and then he streaked. I need to go on. But you can use his name. In his name, you can ask the Father for anything and he'll do it. In his name, you can cast out devils. In his name, you can lay hands on the sick. If you know his name, he will set you on high. He will make you above and not beneath. He'll make you the head, not the tail. Woo! I'm glad you're shouting, but I'm not gonna stop preaching just cause you're shouting. He calls us into the fellowship of his name. He calls us into the fellowship of Christ. Christ is not the last name of Jesus. Christ means Messiah. It means the anointed one. And Jesus calls us into fellowship with his anointing. Hallelujah. I'll give it to you again in John 14 and 12. The works that I do shall you do also and greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. And what happened when he got to the Father? Acts 1 and 8 tells us that you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Hallelujah. So he, when he got to the Father, sent back his anointing. In the, in the baptism, in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. And you partake of his anointing. On the day of Pentecost was the fulfillment. In fact, back in Acts chapter one and verse five, Jesus said you should be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. And then he said, you'll receive power when that happens. And a few days later, on the 50th day from the Passover, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came as a rushing mighty wind filled the house, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance, oh, listen to me, the anointing involves tongues. It involves tongues, hallelujah. And he shares that anointing with you. And the scripture said in Luke chapter 10 and verse 19, behold, I give unto you power over all the power of the devil. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Hallelujah, we've received power 
Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. <laughs> he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed with him, for God was with him. He shares that anointing. So when we come into his fellowship as Christ, we come into the fellowship of his anointing. Praise God. And so we need to go from salvation through, his, through the name of Jesus to the, uh, that, to the baptism in the Holy Ghost, which is uh, sharing his anointing. And then the last one, we've been called into the fellowship of his name, into the fellowship of his anointing, and the last, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We've been called into the lordship of Jesus, to his fellowship. Now, what does that mean for him to be Lord? Well, just this past week, this came to me, and I've never given this illustration before. Everybody knows what a landlord is, don't you? That means whatever house you're living in, your landlord owns that house. Whatever land you're living in, that landlord owns that land. It's not yours. And how many know when you make Jesus the Lord of your life, you recognize that you don't own yourself. He's the owner. As our Lord, he is the owner. Amen. Hallelujah. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 19 and 20 says what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you and which you have of God and you are not your own because you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are the Lord's. <laughs> yeah. You belong to him. He owns you. Philippians 2. And verses 9 through 11 says that God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things on the earth, and things beneath the earth. And all, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. He's my owner. Now let me give you three more verses. Hallelujah. Are you letting this sink in? Yes. Are you getting it? Are you letting it saturate you? <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. John chapter 14 and verse 15. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. To make him Lord is to submit in obedience to him. He's not your Lord if you don't obey him. Jesus said to some, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. If you're gonna call me Lord, you're gonna do my commandments and do what I tell you. So he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, there are people today, those people that say I'm forgiven, and, and, uh, but I'm, I, keep, I still sin, can't help from sinning. There's no help from my sin. Are the same people that say, God loves me. And I, I know in the interrogation of, of some of those people, well, what about somebody <clears throat> that was saved and, and they go out and uh, they uh, uh, either become a prostitute or they become a pimp and, and uh, they are child abusers? They once were saved. What about those people? Well, they come back and say, oh, God loves them. Well, God loves the whole world, but the whole world is not saved. Now, here's something that will help understand. In John chapter 15 and verse 10, Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Even as I keep my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. You see, it's not the question of whether God loves the worst sinner on this earth. He does. But until they abide in his love. 
They're on their way to hell. And Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, then you abide in my love. Don't go around and just say, well, God loves me. He's not going to, uh, he understands my sin. He does not. He says, if you keep my commandments, you're abiding in my love. Whew. I'm doing good. You're doing good, boy. <laughs> One other verse in John, going back to John 14, verse 21. <clears throat> He that has my commandments. And he that keeps my commandments. It is he who loves me. And he that loves me, my father will love. And I will love him and I will manifest myself to him. Is he Lord? If he is Lord, we're going to obey him. If he's Lord, we're going to honor him as having the, the right to tell me what I need to do. And I must obey him. Back in verse eight of, of Philippians two, it says that Jesus himself humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus, the Bible says, learned obedience even. Because every time he was tempted to disobey, he had to learn to obey in the flesh, in the limitations that you and I have. But he never sinned, he was perfect. He died for our sins, but he lived for us to overcome sin. And he says, you shall overcome because I overcome. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. We are called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hallelujah. Lift your hearts and hands, clapping. Praise him. Hallelujah. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Now, Father... Let everybody hear and respond to the call of God into the fellowship of your son, into the fellowship of your name, into the fellowship of your anointing, into the fellowship of your lordship. In the name of Jesus, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. First question, do you know him in his saving name today? Let's just wait just a moment. I want you to search your heart. Do you know him in his saving name? Have you justified your sins? by just focusing upon how he has forgiven you. And you sense no responsibility for your sins. But the word of the Lord, let not sin reign in your mortal body. Don't let your, the members of your body become instruments of unrighteousness. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Oh, let that saving name become real today. Let that saving name become real today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn it loose. Turn it loose. Let it go. You're not in debt to whatever it is you're holding on to. It's a word for somebody this morning. Let it go. Turn it loose. You don't owe it anything. You're not in debt to that fleshly activity. You have no debt to pay to sin. You're free. In the name, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. What is it, what is it that you're holding on to? What is it that you're allowing to rule your life? Let it go. Let it go. Hallelujah. 
Ela bahara bata. Ela da bahara bata. Ela da bahosata. Amara hota bahasa bata. Ela bahara bata. Stir yourself. Stir up yourself. In the Holy Ghost. For you have restricted your lifestyle to the limits of your natural abilities and your natural talents. But the Spirit says to you today, stir up the gift of the Holy Ghost that is in you and enter into a fellowship with his anointing and start moving toward doing the works that he did and living and operating in his anointing. Hallelujah. Give him praise this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> yes, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Word that fits. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't say I can't. Don't say I can't be what he's called me to be. Because he's faithful to make you so that you'll be able to do what he has called you to do and to be what he's called you to be. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Rather fill your mouth and heart with I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength and the ability and the anointing and the help to do it (laughs) and to be it. Hallelujah. I am becoming everything that he's called me to be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus.